The title of our talk is Changing the Way You Think and Work, Agile Accessibility Audits in the Product Lifecycle. And on the screen, I have uh, two Polaroid snapshots of each of us in our masks. My name is Elle Waters, and I work in accessibility product management for Adobe. Um, I am often considered an unreasonable optimist. I am a Caucasian woman with dark hair and green highlights, and I'm wearing a floral top. And I think that's most of what there is to say about me. So John? Thanks, Elle. Uh, my name is John Piotrowski. I am an engagement manager at DQ. I like to consider myself a silver lining specialist. No matter how bad the situation, there's always a positive. Um, I am wearing the purple AxCon shirt with white text, AxCon 2022. Very excited to be here today. Um, I don't know if I missed anything, Al. Very excited to present with you today. That's great. Likewise. So this may go a little bit like a podcast in the sense that John and I have worked very closely together for the last year or so. Um, we may jump over each other a little bit here and there. We're very excited to share some of the things that we learned over the last year with this. So a little bit about Adobe audits, and then I'll kind of describe a little bit about what we'll talk about today. So we almost always include within the standards of what we're auditing, the web content accessibility guidelines, level A, double A, including European standards and section 508. We usually take a representative sample of page views and components to test. And we usually approach our audits through automated testing, manual testing, and some task flow analysis. Some other things to note, we do a lot of different things within Adobe to improve the accessibility of our products, including internal testing and usability studies with people with disabilities. We also partner with a handful of expert accessibility vendors, such as DQ, and we always have room to improve. So this is a snapshot into that formal audit process when we were working with DQ to get a um, snapshot in time of how particular products we're doing and that also created a roadmap for us for improvements to make with existing content. So John. Speaking of formal audit processes, showing on the screen now are uh, a list of somewhat standard and straightforward uh, necessary components to the audit process. So things such as stakeholder engagement, scoping, budget, uh, procurement, groundwork, kickoff, testing, and report delivery. Listed on the screen in what you would probably consider quite the ideal sequence. However, with a caveat and a warning of, uh, it never really goes like this. <laughs> but as Al and I are about to describe to you, uh, it, it might not have to. And that's really kind of what we've learned throughout our process of working together. But one uh, significant note is uh, keep this list in mind. Uh, there's going to be a pretty significant reference uh, to this list at a, a pivotal point in what Al and I had determined uh, a growth uh, and learning process. Great. So oftentimes when we're thinking of an audit, I have on the screen what I visualize when I'm thinking of putting together a project. Um, there may be a statement of work with a vendor partner. You have some timelines associated with things. You have some milestones. And all of this feels a lot like the gears in a machine. And so if you build it and you make sure it's, you know, I've got plenty of oil and you put your hand to this machine, you feel like it's going to go the way that you expect because you've built all these gears and mechanisms to work with one another. However, the reality of audits and other things like that, and especially within the accessibility industry, is it, again, never goes like you expect it to, because we're assuming that all these things are fixed and they're designed exactly as they should be designed and that there's never any conflict. So on the screen, I have a lot of those same gears kind of um, getting, getting locked in with one another and creating all manner of steam and conflict. And so this is really a story about how recognizing that audits are really not like machines, they're much like something else. And so I have now on the screen um, a beautiful, bright, sunny picture of several different um, wooden beehives. And really that's the thinking that helped John and me 
move forward and grow in our understanding about how to do an agile audit because of the fact that we were thinking of it more as there's a structure and there's a system in place, but it's very organic and it's incredibly adaptable to the environment. So one of the things that besides just being a big fan of bees in general, I really love the way that more and more there are articles that are coming out and I'll, I'll post those as well and the resources. Um, I know it doesn't seem like it's about accessibility, but it kind of is about the idea about how bees are incredibly adaptable, that if you have a baby bee that's born, that baby bee could become a queen bee, could become a worker bee. And it depends on the needs of the hive as to what that particular role of that bee is. And likewise, there's a lot of other commonalities that we'll start to touch on. So DQ had done some research last year and we're actually, it was two years ago now because time is very elastic in this, in this particular timeline. They did some research and they found that automated testing, while we often hear that um, automated testing can only identify about 20 to 35%, depending on who you talk to, of the web content accessibility guidelines success criteria. However, what the success criteria are, that's about the standards and how much, how many standards are covered. And what we, what they found was that out in the wild, the tendency for the issues that are caused by people is actually skewed differently. So they did research and you'll see on the screen, there is um, a web link that my controls are covering. So John, maybe you can tell them that web link when I'm done with the slide. Um, over 2,000 audits, 13,000 pages, um, almost 300,000 issues, and they found that 57% of those issues could be captured via automated testing. And so I found that really exciting, especially um, talking with a good friend Glenda Sims about this other piece of this puzzle as well, that over 95% of the issues that were not detected via automated testing came from the following 12 web content accessibility success criteria. Contrast, name role value, parsing, info and relationships, non-text content, focus order, keyboard, use of color, focus visible, resized text, meaningful sequence, and labels or instructions. So when we were looking for an efficient way to test an application that had two different versions, some of our products have a service pack version and some of them have real-time sort of cloud-based versions, but they're essentially, the goal is for them to have parity so that they would be the same application and it didn't matter which a customer is using, they would get the same experience, but they are two different versions. So we had to test two and we wanted to find a really efficient way to be able to do that. And so coupled with automated testing, which you saw earlier was about 57% and these 12 success criteria being heavy emphasis, we did research on previous audits and we found that that would provide over 90% coverage for Adobe products. So in other words, the things that we tend to have gaps on that require improvements to accessibility often fall within either automated testing or these 12 success criteria. So that was what we started calling hybrid testing, meaning it would be a combination of automated testing, this kind of focus on manual testing. We might pick a couple of things in that audit to do really comprehensive testing if we knew that it was going to be a very complex interaction. And then also some task flow analysis with assistive technology. So our first audit out of the gate was something called Adobe Experience Manager Assets. Again, two versions of the same product. This is a legacy product that has new features, meaning this has been in production for quite a long time. As a result of that, it's not as templated as a new product might be. And so it used a combination of different frameworks, which if you're um, experiencing it as an end user, whether visually, programmatically, it will likely feel like the same thing, 
but it may be coming from different frameworks, different code frameworks. And it does bring up the question, what exactly is representative when you don't have as much templated content as you'd like? And so put a pin in that, we'll come back to that. This product had been previously audited in 2019, and we used that as a basis for the scope for the 2021 audit saying, well, we'll start with this and add whatever we need. And our primary strategy before we understood that we were going to go on this adventure of agile audits was really to leverage the hybrid testing so that we could more efficiently test these two versions of the same product. So John, how did it go? It went well, but you know, let's say there's some room for improvement. So uh, we started off in April of 2021. And I think it's significant to say, oh, this was our first audit together. Uh, Mm -hmm. So the first time you and I had worked together uh, in April, 2021, we conducted a kickoff and it was a bit of a stakeholder surprise. So we went into the kickoff and we thought, like you had mentioned, we had that scope defined. We used the basis of the 2019 audit uh, as we're reviewing the project with the stakeholders. The call ended with, uh, you know, the the discovery of the scope was to be reviewed. <laughs> At, <laughs> when when we thought it was ready to go, uh, we found, you know, okay, let's take a step back. It's going to be reviewed. We weren't ready for that, but the need to adapt was was relevant and, and absolutely in place there. So it continued in May 2021. There were some access challenges. So what I mean by that is uh, getting myself access to the platforms for scoping purposes of confirming the scopes for the audit. Uh, in June 2021, we were able to begin testing on the first version. And then in July 2021, we were able to begin testing on the second version, which ultimately uh, resulted in us being able to complete the testing on both versions in August 2021. Uh, And really what this shows is, um, I think, a five-month process uh, as a result of us, you know, not decoupling those components and unnecessarily uh, forcing them to rely on one another at times. So recognizing this, um, the outcome, I have some photos that I think, you know, if I were taking snapshots of how we felt about this audit, these are the pictures that come to mind. The first one is an overgrown farmhouse that looks like it's dilapidated and kind of falling apart in, in the forest. And it's really an image to symbolize the fact that that product had morphed and changed underneath us because of how long it took to be able to get all the pieces in place in order to be able to conduct the audit. And the the scope and stakeholder surprise was not because we hadn't shared the scope with the stakeholders prior to the audit. Um, We actually did that as a necessary precursor to signing the statement of work because the scope is listed in the statement of work. But that scope wasn't as quite as relevant as it could have been had we been faster with everything. The second picture that I have on the screen is a little boy with his hands over his eyes as a finger from an adult is pointing at him. And there was definitely a separation of ownership and investment because of the length of time that it took because of the way that the audit process went and even the the precursor and all the setup, it was something that we found that it felt more like a report card that we delivered to the team. It felt more like a blame game because accessibility audits are kind of notorious for no news is good news, which means that any news you get from an accessibility professional seems like bad news. So this kind of heightened that process. And then last but certainly not least, I have a picture of my cat taco and it says new product team who dis and it's because the amount of time it took for us to do the audit the people that we talked to in the beginning were not the people we talked to at the end so john and i felt pretty certain that this is not the best way to run an audit so chapter two oh wait before that chapter one agile lessons prepare for blockers kind of like today's delay um, we decided we needed to get scoping done earlier. That was our first attempt at trying to solve for that. The second was stakeholder engagement is clearly vital. And so we knew we needed to find better ways to involve stakeholders in the audit process. So that was a, that was a sad chapter. So let's go to chapter two. Chapter two, the second audit. 
This is a journey, a, Adobe Journey Optimizer, the product that we wanted to audit. It was a brand new product that leveraged Adobe's Spectrum design system, which has a lot of accessibility built into it. And we had highly engaged stakeholders and teams. By nature, this team was very energetic, very enthusiastic. And we had actually not one, but 10 accessibility champions across multiple teams that helped contribute to Adobe, Adobe Journey Optimizer. So we definitely, in our strategy wanted to keep leveraging the hybrid testing, but we wanted to see if we could start scoping earlier to improve um, the product stakeholder engagement and that scoping process. Then we also thought about, let's add this idea of beginning testing when it's ready. We'll prioritize everything. And sometimes components require data to be populated for you to be able to test it. And if we didn't have that yet, we would move to the next thing on the list of priorities. And that way we weren't testing when the scoping was complete, we were testing when the scoping was ready. And then another addition is we wanted to add some consulting hours for follow-up validation. So John, how did chapter two AJO audit go? I will say it was an improvement. Absolutely. So it began in May, 2021, uh, a month later from chapter one. That's when we <laughs> began scoping. And then in June, 2021, we conducted the kickoff uh, and we attempted to finalize the scoping, but we made it agile. And what we mean by that is we took a different approach to the platform access. So we knew what the scope was that we wanted to include, and there was a problem with uh, different pieces of functionality and attaining access to it. So what we did was we managed those access issues by documenting the audit scope into JIRA and then assigning it to those accessibility champions within the product team. It was actually worked really well. We saw a lot of action get taken just because of the responsibility that's associated with JIRA assignments. Uh, and then it really worked well as we transitioned into audit results as well, because it provided a transparency of, you know, when certain component testing is done, we were able to mark that so the team was aware that, okay, these are the final results. We know everything we need to be aware of. Uh, it worked really well. Uh, so in July, 2021, we finalized platform access. And then as Elle had mentioned, also in July, we began batch testing. So what that means is we recognize the lack of the need to wait for the full access and began batch, uh, batch testing with, you know, what was available essentially allowed us to, you know, remove that dependency and, and decouple certain things. And in August 2021, the audit was complete. And I think the one thing to note here is that it started a month later than AEM assets, but it finished at the same time. So that's why I say improvement. I think it was an improvement too, because really part of the platform access is because this was a brand new product. So the product didn't really actually exist in its current form in May. So that was something that we had to sort of be fluid about as well. When you're scoping a brand new product, some of that stuff is evolving in front of you. So even though it looks like it's only a month of time that we saved, it was actually a whole lot of stuff that we learned. So the outcome for this one, I have a Polaroid snapshot of two children holding a parachute. I don't know if any of you remember from childhood, perhaps where you had a parachute game and everyone kind of had to work together. And, you know, to this day, I don't really know what the goal of that game was, except that it was fun. It was cool and we enjoyed it. And so some of the team probably didn't really understand what we were doing, but they were enthusiastic about it nonetheless. And so to me, that was definitely a plus. And then the second snapshot I have is um, another group of children that are sitting around the base of a tree and they're examining nature and looking at sticks and looking at a magnifying glass and poking at things. And the inquisitive nature of the AJO team was exceptional. They were so engaged that they wanted to immediately start resolving issues while we were auditing still. And that that enthusiasm, that proactive nature was something that was partly just the nature of who this team is, but also because of the fact that we, I think, because we brought the scoping into a JIRA process, they started understanding and it started to resonate with them exactly how they thought. So here's a fun fact. This team was so engaged and fired up about accessibility that they are still independently discussing accessibility in their regular team communications. So it is delightful to see a relatively new team 
um, encouraging one another about 400% in reflow and timelines to be able to complete work. And it wasn't something I had to generate that conversation. So chapter two, Agile Lessons. Um, Increased stakeholder engagement actually improves value. So one of the things that we had tried to do with the AEM Asset Audit was to involve stakeholders only as much as they wanted to be involved and to try not to be a disruption to their process. That seems like a natural way to ensure that you'll get things done in a, in a good way. But when you don't have that increased stakeholder engagement, you get things like that stakeholder surprise. And it actually improves the value that if you deepen stakeholder engagement, it improves the value and it may not speed something up, but the quality and the investment that they have is much, much richer. And so likewise though, shared ownership does increase velocity. Being able to collaboratively scope for the audit and put those things into JIRA and put the word blocked as the status and assign it to someone absolutely raise the attention and helped us remove those blockers earlier. And then the last piece that we thought about was that Agile really does apply to the business process, not just the software development life cycle. So we wanted to investigate different ways to decouple unrelated activities in that long list that John had provided to see how we could continue to accelerate the audit process. So the third audit, this is um, similar to AEM assets. So it was a little bit a uh, closer combination to understand how do we take these agile lessons and apply it to a very similar product to AEM assets. Um, we wanted to audit Adobe Experience Manager sites. Again, this had two versions of the same product, and this is a massive part of Adobe Experience Manager, a large part of that overall solution. It is an existing product, and it also used multiple frameworks, which again brought up the question, what exactly is representative? So as our strategy, we wanted to continue leveraging hybrid testing so that we could efficiently test two versions. We wanted to take some of the lessons from Journey Optimizer and deepen stakeholder engagement earlier in the process. We wanted to definitely keep the JIRA scoping so that we would have greater transparency and collaboration. And then we thought, well, let's try and scope even earlier with stakeholders, because that seems to be the thing that drags an audit process out. And we also wanted to keep those consulting hours for follow-up validation. So John, chapter three, AEM Sites, how did it go? Well, if Adobe Journey Optimizer was an improvement, I would say AEM Sites was a major improvement. And I think pointing to that list of components, it's typical for any audit, this is that moment of uh, the pivotal point in our growth and learning process. You know, we saw an opportunity for major improvement. And I think it started when, uh, you know, I was involved in the product walkthrough. So it removed blockers of any misunderstandings of scope, you know, as the product team was explaining the significance of different components of the platform, I was there to understand it, to understand different pieces of the scope, not just the what, but the how. Um, you know, and because of this, what you'll notice, so in August 2021, we have the product walkthrough listed as well as access for myself at DQ. And then in September 2021, uh, once the contract was finalized, the scope was confirmed almost immediately. As soon as scope was confirmed, we were able to begin testing. Uh, as testing was ongoing uh, to maintain that stakeholder engagement and build that excitement and keep it going through, you know, the velocity of the, the audit, uh, we did the kickoff. And then uh, when the kickoff really probably a, a week or so later, the audit uh, was complete. Um, so keep in mind, this was two separate versions of a very large platform, uh, quite a large task for testing purposes. Um, and, and really, like I said, this is where we started to put into practice what we learned from chapters one and two. Which is amazing. When you think about the idea of going from April to August, for a similar product and then taking an even bigger one that had a lot of the same kind of structure, timeline, age of product. There weren't a lot of differences between those two. And I do credit it to trying to learn how to be able to make these things more efficient. So that is, um, at least in enterprise world, that's a pretty rapid turnaround to be able to say in the same month, we have signed the statement of work and also had the kickoff and delivered all that you know, DQ's delivered all the testing results. Pretty amazing. So the outcome I have on the screen in this um, beautiful, elegant dining room with a chandelier, I have 
uh, six people <laughs> who are in sort of a downward dog pose, but they're shaped like a pyramid with three people on the bottom, two people in the middle, and one person on top. And it's really to symbolize the idea that even though there were individual parts and stakeholders and participants in this whole audit process, it really started to come together and feel much more like we were working together towards a common goal. And that was very exciting. One of uh, the agile lessons we knew before was that increased engagement equals increased velocity. And we recognized that having John join a product walkthrough during the statement of work creation. So as we were starting to form what is the shape of this project, having him invested in that part of the project meant that he had so much more context. And so we definitely wanted to find more ways to do that. And then we were getting a little bit emboldened, I guess. And John and I are asking, you know, let's question the entire established process for everything. For example, does scoping really depend on budget if you're doing an agile audit? Or does it really more depend on priorities? And so let's go to our fourth audit. This was the last one that we'll talk about today. We actually ended up completing about seven audits last year. Um, and yet this is definitely uh, the culmination of all of our good lessons. I'm very excited to share about this one. So this product was for Adobe Experience Platform, and it is one of our flagship products. It is only one version, but it is a massive product, and it is filled with a lot of complex workflows and interactions. Uh, some could say that all roads lead to experience platform with dig digital experience products at Adobe. And it's because a goal, a goal that we have is to make it a seamless ecosystem for people to conduct a lot of activities and have a lot of services available without having to move to individual products. And so a lot of things stream into experience platform. So we, as our st strategy, we definitely still wanted to leverage hybrid testing, because we had found that to be super helpful, even when not looking at two different versions, but recognizing all of those statistics were holding out that we were getting great coverage and getting really valuable testing time for that. The other is we wanted to keep um, the idea of early access for DQ as much as possible through scope, scoping. Groundwork is usually just confirmation of what that scope is and doing it through JIRA. And then as an improvement, we wanted to see how we could sort of move more towards that journey optimizer level of engagement. So we wanted to engage the primary product stakeholder as an equal partner and not just a customer or a client, which is how I've done it in the past, thinking, well, this is, person is my primary stakeholder. And if I'm acting as a product owner, that I want to be able to do this for her. Instead, think of it more as an equal partnership. And then we wanted to decouple scoping entirely from the procurement process. And that depends on understanding what your budget requirements are. And it does depend on a trust between client and vendor to know that no one is trying to do something you know, unsavory. But the idea what we would want to do is to take, this is our budget, and we will test in that budget with what we've got. So instead of talking about these particular components that had to be finalized in order to know what the audit would require, we looked at what is your budget so that we could just push through a statement of work and then work together on that. And then that allowed us as well to keep the consulting hours for follow-up validation. So John, how did it go with Experience Platform? Well, it went quite well. So the first thing to say is I think it's fair to say we maintained our velocity that we gained during the sites audit, but for an even more comprehensive platform. And I think when we were building this presentation and determining how to you know, speak to this, this audit, it went so well. Um, it was said perfectly, Al, I think you said it, you, know, so you said, what happens if everything we learned in chapters one, two, and three comes together perfectly? And essentially that's really what happened here. Everything we learned yeah. from the first three that we've discussed came together perfectly here because uh, in November, 2021, there was a product walkthrough where access was provided to DQ. Uh, initial scoping was completed as the engagement contract was finalized all in November. And then in December 2021, where we conducted the kickoff, we also began testing. We uh, iteratively finalized the scope based on the budget and the uh, significance of each component to include in the testing. And in the same month, we completed the audit, uh, extremely comprehensive audit. 
uh, it really came together well. And uh, Al, I think as you would speak to, um, there's a there's a pretty significant, you know, one significant reason for that. Yeah. So uh, I became a huge fan of competitive cheerleading, which is so not me <laughs> because of that Netflix series cheer. And uh, just this is a warning that the next image that I'm going to play has animation, but I'll describe it and also kind of speak to why we have it, though you don't have to watch it for too long as well. So just and then I'll move to the next slide. But the thing that's fascinating to me about competitive cheer is that um, there's a thing, uh, there's a position, a role called the flyer. And that is usually um, a young, small female cheerleader who gets tossed up into the air, does these amazing movements and everything. Sorry, someone's at the door. And, and all of her team catches her. And the important thing to think about is that the audience may see the flyer, but it takes everyone working in concert with one another and everyone depending on each other to have that kind of experience. And so this was what I would consider the outcome of the AEP audit. And that person, that flyer was our stakeholder, our accessibility champion, Annie Houston. She's a senior UX product manager at Adobe, and she was so incredibly invested and engaged that she was an equal partner in the work that we did. And during the audit, she was helping to prioritize what was most impactful, getting a first-hand masterclass education in accessibility and truly the star of the show. And I have to say that this opened up huge opportunities for us to position Annie as the champion and the accessibility advocate. And also again, the flyer that people would focus on. And that's really what you want to be able to do. As an accessibility professional, you want to take the person who is responsible for that product and make them the hero of the story because of their investment in accessibility. So chapter four, Agile Lessons, and then we'll cut to Q&A. Um, what you think is a dependency might not actually be one. So we decoupled the budget from the scope and we were able to move a lot faster and make real time decisions based on priority and value throughout the audit. So if we found that something was no longer useful for us to test because we'd learned everything we needed to learn, then we could move to something else. And then the second was communicate in the language of your team. If your team is agile, you should be communicating in their language. So the more we aligned our audit process to a product team's typical way of working, the more engagement we got and the better project outcome. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that small failures return huge value if you're willing to learn. So if you learn through experimentation, that old adage of build, test, learn, pivot, then you're going to be able to tweak parts of your process instead of looking at it as an entire monolith, and you'll have well-informed questions to answer in future audits. So questions that we have going into our next audits is to really understand and define what do we consider representative in this product or all Adobe products. And then because of the way that this moved through the AEP audit with Annie, we really want to investigate the idea of teaching by audit in batches. And then John, I think you had some insights about what you'd like to do with shifting left as well. Yeah, shifting left with automated testing. It's always significant. It's always important. Uh, results in cleaner audits. Uh, if for nothing else, you know, with shifting left with automated testing, uh, it'll result in the lower cost of implementing fixes during development rather than in production. Yeah. And I think we're really interested to see what we can start doing with design reviews and other things like that with some of these principles as well. So. Be agile, um, corny, B-E-E. -E. Focus on the common goal, work in small independent maneuvers, and where it adds value, act in collaboration with the hive. If a process works and it can be repeated, do that. Prioritize communication. That is a huge one. That's how beehives survive and thrive. Swarm occasionally as needed and expect change as part of the process. So plan to adapt. So we would love to hear any questions, have some conversation. We have our email addresses on the screen, ewaters at adobe.com. And John is john.piotrowski, P-I-O-T-R-O-W-S-K-I at dq.com. So please, Tamer, what do we got? Any good questions? 
All right, awesome. Well, thank you both Elle and John for a great presentation and lots of uh, great lessons learned. So thank you for sharing them with us. Uh, so yes, we do have lots of questions and let me, and we and the good news is we have time. So that, that's great. So okay. we've got to cover as many questions as we can. All right, so the first question is, how do you plan to deal with deltas between audits from year to year? And there are a couple of follow-up questions to that. Uh, let me also let me mention those, and then you can talk about it in length. Sure. Uh, do you redo an entire audit, or do you just do parts of the application? The delta will change. And also, how do you deal with risk of regression? So go ahead. So there's a lot of questions. Um, so keeping in mind that the formal audit process that that John and I went through is one piece of your overall sort of testing management for accessibility. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to wait year to year to year, and that was the only kind of audit or any kind of testing that we did, then I agree you would have some pretty significant risk because not only are you not capturing necessarily all of the new features um, when they're being built, you're ca catching them after they've been released to production. And we all know that old adage about how costly it is to fix something in production versus fixing it earlier in the life cycle. So we do a lot of informal testing and we also have internal uh, testing with our teams. So the goal is, and it, you know, mileage varies depending on how mature the team is, but the goal is to have design reviews, with accessibility team members and or amongst themselves to have some um, feedback at the design stage and that those designers put things together in annotated form and that developers um, use a series of different kinds of testing throughout the engineering portion of the life cycle. So whether that's running acts from a browser or using a linter um, and then conducting keyboard accessibility testing, those are kind of the must have stakes and having that happen as well. And then we do have usability studies with people with disabilities um, for new features, things that were like really exploring interaction patterns for the first time. So you start to see this sort of layered um, web, I guess you could say of testing coverage. So, to answer the first question, we we deal with that and we also deal with regressions because this is not the only way that we're looking to test. And the formal audit process has some um, veracity because it's through a trusted third party. It's not this um, small piecemeal kind of testing that we do in the regular life cycle. So it has sort of, like I said, a snapshot in time. It also allows us to build an accessibility conformance report, which is gonna be pretty comprehensive looking at that. Um, I'm not sure if there were other parts of that question. Maybe I didn't answer, but that's what I have for right now, I think, for feedback for that. John, did you want to speak to that at all or go to the next question either way? Very well said. I don't think I could top you there, Elle. I think one <laughs> thing that's important to note is it's not just about the audit. There's also, uh, as you call it, assistive technology acceptance testing or screen reader mm -hmm. acceptance testing. So even even within each audit, you know, similar to usability testing, it's it's taken you know even a step further and kind of yeah. points to some of those results we find during the audit that helps you anticipate you know future needs. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. All right. So the next question is about. Uh, engaging and sort of managing stakeholders. So uh, yes. uh, the question is, uh, I understand the importance of accessibility, but is there any strategy that you could suggest share to engage all stakeholders in this process? Um, I could tell you what's worked for me, but I don't know that I would say this is always uh, a good fit for everyone because some of this depends on your personality. So um, uh, what feels like a thousand years ago, I used to work in an accessibility agency and we coined the phrase, the hug it out philosophy. And it's because we decided that we would overwhelm people with kindness and compassion to where they had no choice, but to want to partner with us. <laughs> and I don't know if that's really a recommendation I should give at this point, but I do know that the more authentic 
and engaged you are and invested in your stakeholders that you are, the more likely you're going to get that kind of partnership. So instead of, um, and we all do this, especially these days, hiding behind technology and sending emails and then expecting some kind of relationship to be built in that way. Think about the highest level of contact that you can have. If you're in a situation where you're able to meet in person, all things considered, um, in this strange new world, then that would be an excellent opportunity. If not, real-time communication, um, whether that be through video chat or even like Slack chat or something, some way to build rapport, I think is important. So keeping in mind, you can't do that with every single stakeholder all the time, but really look at it as a way to build partnership. And I think that the more that you invest in your partners, the more likely you'll see that returned back to you. Perfect, awesome. Uh, okay, another question also related to stakeholders is how do you handle stakeholders, developers, or others who are blockers that contribute <laughs> to scope creep? <laughs> you so are my blocker. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I don't know about the last part about whether it contributes to scope creep. I think I'm. I am probably not the right person to ask about scope creep because I'm usually the person who's the instigator of scope creep for stuff like that. But I think that having somebody who is um, antagonistic to your accessibility efforts is always a challenge. Again, no one is, in, very few people are intentionally trying to um, create barriers for access for people with disabilities. Most people are either negligent or they're sometimes perhaps just thinking selfishly, but the large majority of people are acting out of ignorance and not malice. And so recognizing that when you're working with someone, especially these days, you it's hard to know the kind of struggles that someone may be having. Um, one of the challenges that we had with the AM Assets Audit was that changing of team members. And I didn't mention this during the talk, but the reason why is because we had team members who were out with COVID. We had a lot of Indian team members who were having significant struggles with lockdown. And so it, empathy is a, is, a, is a powerful thing. And so the more you exhibit it, the more I, I'm a firm believer that the more it comes back towards you. So those, those stakeholders or developers that are kind of blockers, I love that a person can be a blocker, um, that it's really trying to get at the why, and then also take the pieces away that aren't dependent on that person's involvement. If you get to the point where you can't move forward because one reason or another, then, you know, Agile is also about making the best out of whatever is handed to you. So it may not be the perfect audit, but you can learn from that experience and have a retrospective and even share with that person and use radical candor. When you do this, this is what happens. So that would be my recommendation. John, I'm sure you've had plenty of antagonistic stakeholders before. What would you recommend? Communication. It's key. Like you had mentioned, establish lines of communication. Give yourself an opportunity to explain the why. So, yeah. you know, I've been explained as politely relentless. You know, keep that goal in the, <laughs> at the front of your mind. You know, keep, keep the goal in mind. Make sure people are aware of what's needed, when it's needed. Um, but don't just make it an action item. Like you said, empathy, be able to communicate yeah. and help them understand, you know, why certain things are needed and not just uh, a task list that that's never, uh, that never makes the job easier. Agreed. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, all right. So there's a question about, you, you mentioned uh, L that you use Jira. So the yes. question is, did both Adobe and DQ use Jira in order to create tickets? How did they you manage did. that? They did. Um, so it, it, I'm not sure that everybody has the kind of um, collaborative envir work environment that Adobe has. And so recognizing that you may have to think a little differently if you don't have that. But it was important to us to create as few gates as possible. So John has a, a an Adobe account and he was able to have things assigned to him in Jira. So we had an Epic for the audit and we had all of the steps, uh, including, you know, 
budget confirmed, scope confirmed, and all of that. And then we had all of the components that we were thinking of as representative components in there as separate um, either tasks, I think, at that point, or subtasks, and they would be assigned to him. And then he would know whether he needed to assign it to me or one of our product stakeholders if they needed to provide credentials. And additionally, um, the those who are doing the testing also have JIRA access so that they can log bugs directly into JIRA. And it's, I will say, a true test of um, your trust in another organization when you allow them to do bulk imports, because that is some heady stuff in JIRA. And yet we definitely appreciate that because when you've got all of your test results, the easiest way to be able to get that into JIRA is to format it, take that Excel spreadsheet, and then import it. So the short answer is yes, they did. And that's exactly why that became a much faster process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so next question is, uh, are you still doing audits in hybrid way or can the scope for each audit be totally different? Or maybe the scope uh, anyway is inspired by the hybrid audits? I think that we tested the theory um, that was from the DQ research and found that to be absolutely accurate. With that said, I think, um, everything should be revisited every time. That's my opinion, because there's no reason to think that one way to do things is the only way to do things. Additionally, um, we did find ourselves saying that, say, 90% of the audit was done in this hybrid methodology, but we would come across things that are brand new interaction patterns. And even though we had done perhaps some usability research on it before, we still wanted to test it fully, not only to make sure it had been implemented correctly, but when we got to the assistive technology acceptance testing portion, we wanted to just get that continual verification that we're on the right path with specifically keyboard navigation and AT support. So those particular things started to get pulled out as this we will do as comprehensively as we know how. And I think that's a good way to approach it is think that you have a lot of things in your toolbox and some things are great for that first pass and then some things take a little more refinement after that. All right. Thanks, so. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, next question I have. Okay, I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. So uh, the next one is, how often do you go through audits? So these formal, products? yeah, these formal audits, um, our goal is to have an annual audit so that we can have that sort of uh, fresh accessibility conformance report. It's part of our governance process. Um, if you ever, read, there's a blog post about the common controls framework that Adobe Security had implemented for their own governance for security and had been very successful at Adobe. So Andrew Kirkpatrick, the head of accessibility at Adobe, um, looked at that and thought, you know, innovatively, what if we decided to have the same kind of CCF process for accessibility and having a yearly audit as a part of that. The other thing that that audit allows for is it coupled with new designs, new features, new development, it helps shape the accessibility roadmap. So what we do then is we have any issues from an audit that weren't already addressed by the time we're doing that roadmap planning along with new features, and we put that on an accessibility roadmap. It's nice because if you only do the small iterative testing, you don't ever see the big picture, and you also don't always have like macro level goals with a team. And this allows a team to think, these are my yearly goals with accessibility. But um, but yeah, we do other kinds of informal testing as well, so. Thank you, uh, mm -hmm. uh All right, so it looks like we are out of time, unfortunately. We still have a few more questions, but uh, I guess for the questions that we couldn't get to, uh, please, feel free to reach out directly yes. to Elle and John. Yes. Uh, you have their contact information there in that last slide. Uh, and I want to thank you, Elle and John, so much for this great session. And I look forward to hearing more success stories uh, as you do your next audit and continue <laughs> to improve your great. process uh, and continue to maintain your high velocity accessibility. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And again, apologize for the delay uh, and the technical issues that we had earlier. Uh, a reminder, you can always come back and watch the recording at any time. It will be available on the same page. Uh, so enjoy the rest of XCON and have a great day or evening.
Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.